We're really glad that uh, David Malkin can be here today. Uh, many of us know him as a creator of Wondermark, uh, which uh, he's devoting his time after a, a career that involved uh, uh, editing Hollywood movie trailers, which is something I'm also a uh, big fan of. Uh, so, and uh, we uh, are especially glad to have him here. With, as many of you know, we have a lot of people working here on Google Books, and we make old books available in hopes that awesome things like Wondermark will happen uh, from making all these old things possible. So, uh, David, thank you very much. And he's here to talk about true stuff from old books. Yes? That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for the invitation. Um, come on in. Uh, as you said, my name is David Malky. I have a comic strip called Wondermark. Some of you may be familiar with it. If, if not, uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview uh, by virtue of showing you uh, an episode, and I'll read it to you. We got a guy on the phone here. He's listening to the phone and it says, Your call is very important to us. Please listen carefully, as our menu options have recently changed. For billing, press 1. For sales, press 2. For technical support, <laughs> press pi. If you know your party's extension, you may dial it in reverse order using your touchstone phone. To access a company directory, please hold your phone receiver over a stove and watch the patterns the steam makes when viewed against a dark background. <laughs> to report a lost or stolen car, twist the receiver in opposite directions with both hands. Have a resealable glass container nearby to catch the liquid that emerges from the earpiece. <laughs> in a dark, quiet room, press your face against the mouth of the container and tell the liquid exactly what happened to your card. Vivid memories are best. The good times your card enabled you to have. Tell it all this and seal it. Let the liquid harden into a gel in the cool cupboard. In seven to ten business days, you will receive a packet of seeds. Plant the seeds in the gel in the shape of a regular heptagon. He's thinking, man, these options have changed. <laughs> uh, so comics like this are, uh, they run on my website twice a week, and I make them in kind of an interesting way. Uh, I make them out of pieces of other illustrations, uh, which come from uh, catalogs, magazines, books, all sorts of things from the Victorian era, typically the 1860s through the 1890s, which was the era when engraving reached a high art, and before photography put all those guys out of a job. So the guy on the left here is made of all these different pieces, different shapes, different uh, chunks, Frankenstein style, from different images. It's kind of like playing with Legos, except the Legos are the crafts of old, of old dead people. <laughs> uh, here's another example. Here's a guy uh, with a little motorized bike. And maybe I want uh, some kind of a sailboat with a propeller on it. Uh, look, there's a windmill. How about a Sears robot catalog full of uh, gears and gizmos and sprockets? I can take them all apart and uh, put some other things together. And now you got this guy. <laughs> uh, he is, of course, on the cover of, uh, the, of the books you have there, Dapper Caps and Pedal Copters. And making things like this out of other things, I think, is a really constructive process and is really fun. And it's a different way to make comics than, than most other people. So uh, I'm really happy to have accidentally stumbled across this amazing technique. Uh, I'm not the first to come up with it, and I have not been the last, but I'm clearly the best. So. <laughs> uh, I get the images from old books. And in this particular case, this was a box that a lady in Nova Scotia sent me from her library. They otherwise would have been thrown away. Uh, she emailed me and said, would you like these? And I said yes. Uh, so I received a box in the mail followed by two others in rapid succession. And uh, they're full of these cool old uh, images and I'll page through them and uh, I'll look for, for interesting things that I can use to make comics. But the cool thing is that when I look through these books I get captivated by the articles and by the stories and, and, and I end up reading things I never would have encountered before. And that's what all uh, the, the stuff I'm going to show you today is about, it's the stuff that I found that provides a little window into this period of 100 years ago. Now, for example, the Albany Argus has espoused the beard movement. Uh, this article is from uh, the 1870s. This is its argument. We have come to the conclusion that the practice of shaving is alike ridiculous and absurd, and that it violates one of the laws of nature. Now, our beard was not given us for no purpose, that is evident. It was created for some wise purpose, and that was to keep the face and throat warm, <laughs> and thus be conducive to health. Let us look at a few facts. It has been calculated that if one shaves three times a week, it grows 20 times as fast as if he did not shave. Allowing two inches as the annual growth of the beard, it will be seen that a man cuts off 40 inches, or more than a yard of hair a year. And the nutriment which supports this, and is thus wasted, 
might have gone to nourish other parts of his body and render him a healthy and handsome man. <laughs> Again, allowing 20 minutes to each shaving operation three times a week amounts to one hour a week, 52 hours a year. Supposing a man to shave 40 years, we find he has consumed about three months in the simple act of shaving. And calculating the expense of each operation at the small sum of six cents, we find that this cost him $360. <laughs> In view of these facts, we cannot but regard the practice of shaving as a decidedly barbarous one, and which ought, and which ought to be discountenanced by the progressive civilization of the age. This is the sort of thing that shows up in a newspaper back in the 1800s. Um, two things I want to point out to you. Number one is barbarous. <laughs> Number two is discountenance. <laughs> the Victorians love puns. They love puns. It's ridiculous how much they love puns. I mean, see a lot more of this. Uh, the pun is the highest form of Victorian humor. Uh, but the other cool thing is finding uh, not just strange windows into things like the beard movement, which was from 1848 to 1900, but uh, inventions that seemed like great ideas, but for some reason never quite caught on. Uh, this is from an issue of Scientific American magazine, Gentilly's Glossograph. Does anyone have any idea what the glossograph might be for? Any, any ideas at all? Do you put your head in the little stirrups on the left right there? You put your head in the little stirrups. Well, the thing is about this big. Oh, okay. So probably not, but it's a very good guess. And someone said the tongue, it's also a very good guess. Let's read about it. An easily managed instrument, shown in figure one, is provided with delicate levers, which rest upon the different parts of the tongue and lips, and slender wings swing before the nostrils. The levers of this instrument may be taken in the mouth without any inconvenience. So <laughs> that top uh, graph, you see those arcs? Those are the things that sit in your mouth and rest on your tongue and lips. On speaking, these levers and the wings move, and their motions are transferred, partly in a mechanical way and partly by electricity, to a writing pencil, which marks the single sound with great precision upon six lines parallel and near to each other on a strip of paper, which is moved forward by hand or clockwork. Upon the utterance of the vowels and consonants, moving one or more parts of the organs of speech more or less strongly, or upon the air being exhaled through the nose, the signs corresponding to the sounds uttered are recorded and may be read at once. So this bottom uh, graph, this little seismograph, is the record of how your lips have moved. Stenography, through the use of this apparatus, which the inventor calls a glossograph, becomes, in a certain measure, the public property of everyone who will undertake the easy and interesting labor of learning the key of this nature's self-writing. <coughs> this apparatus may be used for the recording of public speeches, not by the orator himself but by one employed for that purpose, who takes the instrument in his mouth and repeats the speech <coughs> softly. For the voice plays no part in bringing out the signs. So let me, let me explain this. This <laughs> device sits in your mouth, and someone is up here talking like I am, and someone else, off to the side, is mouthing the speech. <laughs> and a strip of paper is coming out of it. <laughs> and then later this is spooled up and someone, I guess, can read it. Uh, so really, the, a very efficient way to record uh, uh, information. The glossograph has the advantage over stenography as it is practiced now, as it requires no previous study or practice. It demands no straining of the attention, just say the words. It, it does all the work, right? Labor-saving device, that's the promise of technology. And consequently causes no weariness. Only the deciphering requires practice. <laughs> The employment of an apparatus which will enable us to write four or five times as rapidly as formerly, especially in an age when so much writing is done as in hours, will not be confined to the noting down of public speeches, and if the compass of the practical value of this invention has only been glanced at, it must be perceived that there is a fruitful principle in it which is capable of great development. Never caught on. You don't really know why. <laughs> uh, but here is another example of the sort of thing that Scientific American will print. And you'll go from the glossograph to this in just no time flat, one after the other. The Cornell Owl. <clears throat> During the past week, a bittern, a duck, and four owls have been received at the laboratory. One of the owls is kept alive. So something happened to everything else. <laughs> <laughs> he has disposed of parts of several fish, a chipmunk, and a live snake two feet long. The encounter with the snake was quite amusing. <laughs> the owl, on spying him in a glass case, evinced a desire to form a closer acquaintance. And so the snake was placed on the floor of the laboratory. This is what I like about these scientists. <laughs> they said, the snake is in a case. 
The owl can't get to them, but let's solve that one. <laughs> Put them together. Probably take very careful notes. <laughs> the owl, with one fell swoop, came down upon his snake ship. And striking its claws into his back, raised his head to his mouth and instantly smashed it. Then commenced the process of deglutition. The owl proceeded to swallow the snake's head first, and proceeded badly enough until, after a minute's struggle, all was swallowed but two inches of the tail. At this point, the owl stopped to take breath, and stood with its eyes slowly blinking, while the two inches of tail, still visible, was wiggling vigorously. At last, summoning up courage, the owl gave a last struggle, and the end of the tail disappeared, still wiggling, down his throat. Scientific American magazine. <laughs> um, there is a real, I think, interesting uh, uh, observation here uh, that, that we can make sort of in retrospect, and that is they're very interested in inventions and they're very interested in things that go in your mouth and record stenography. <laughs> and they're also very interested in things that are just weird. And they're like, we got to write this down. We can't let this just vanish. This experience that we all had in this laboratory, watching this owl eat this snake. Someone's writing this down, right? Let's send it to Scientific American. And Scientific American, to their credit, said, awesome. <laughs> this is YouTube. Yeah, this is YouTube of a hundred years ago. Everyone's sitting around saying, did the new issue come in yet? And then someone reads it like I just did. Here's another example. This is just the tiniest scrap in a giant newspaper full of all sorts of other things. Uh, one of these papers, which are very pleasant light reading, is, and this was actually a review paper of other books and magazines. So it's basically short synopses, capsule summaries of other, other things out in the public at that time. One of these papers, which are very pleasant light, light reading, is General Middleton's paper in the United Service magazine, entitled, An Old Soldier's Pets. They were as follows. A capuchin monkey, a young kangaroo, a magpie, which saved itself on one occasion from being worried by a dog by whistling the first three or four bars of Nick's My Dolly Pals, a nil guy, which is some sort of a horse creature, which he tried to ride and which nearly killed him, a couple of mongooses, two young tigers, a couple of monkeys, an otter, and a small black bear. Most of these animals came from five I tried to find the actual paper in Old Soldier's Pets, and I could not find it on Google Books, so get on that. But uh, I did find several other newspapers citing how amazing that thing was. And they were all basically like this, like, guys, you gotta read in Old Soldier's Pets, because this guy's menagerie is amazing. And here is another uh, example of the heady, uh, 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 adventure-seeking spirit of the age. Uh, do any of you have ever heard of Hiram S. Maxim? He was a very famous gunsmith, electrician, and inventor. He was from the United States, from Maine. He ended up moving to England and became a British subject. And uh, in the 1890s, he invented a flying machine. He's one of many people working on flying machines prior to the Wright brothers. And uh, this is a little article from 1893 explaining all about his flying machine. It was steam powered. It had a boiler on board. Uh, so this, this image is of the machine on the rails as it appeared in 1893. This is the machine of 1893 as it would appear in the air. Um, this is the starboard side of the machine after the accident. <laughs> Didn't work as well as he would have thought. But for not the reason you might expect, this is the really interesting thing. Here's Hiram Maxim himself, and this guy was a curmudgeon. I found his autobiography on Google Books, and it's a delightful read because everything is this great invention and then the people who hated me for it. And this guy wanted to charge me 200 pounds to chop down the trees on my own property. Meanwhile, I'm inventing a flying machine. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth. It's really fascinating. But here's what he has to say. At the time, and this is a paper he wrote for a, a research journal. At the time I commenced my experiments in aeronautics, it was not generally believed that it would ever be possible to make a large machine heavier than the air that would lift itself from the earth by dynamic energy generated by the machine itself. It is true that a great number of experiments had been made with balloons, but these are in no sense true flying machines. Everyone who attempted a solution of the question by machines heavier than the air was looked upon in very much the same light as a man who now attempts to construct a perpetual motion machine. Up to within a few years, ne excuse me, nearly all experiments in aerial navigation by flying machines have been made by men not versed in science, and who for the most part have been ignorant of the most rudimentary laws of dynamics. It is only quite recently that scientific engineers have taken up the question and removed it from the hands of charlatans and mountebanks. Mountebanks is the word I'd like to bring back. 
<laughs> a few years ago, many engineers would not have dared to face the ridicule which they would be liable to receive if they had asserted that it would be possible to make a machine that would lift itself by mechanical means into the air. However, thanks to the admirable, at the admirable work of Professor Langley, Professor Thurston, Mr. Chanute, and others, one may now express his opinion freely on this subject and speculate as to the possibilities of making flying machines without being relegated to the realm of cranks and fanatics. So this, uh, this decade of the 1890s was when the science of powered flight was really starting to come into, uh, in, into real, uh, uh, under scientific scrutiny. He, uh, Hiram Maxim was such an inventor and so wealthy by this point that he could build giant machines and he had a, a hangar out there near London where he was building his uh, experiments and he built multiple uh, propellers to see which would work the, the most efficiently in the air. And he is really dedicated to solving this problem. This is uh, uh, a latter-day artist representation of what happened on his, on his most successful and last flight. Um, the machine, and the reason he used the steam boiler was not because he was an idiot, but because at the time it was the most efficient per pound, horsepower per pound. And he had a rail that he ran that ship on, and he had another rail balanced above it because he didn't want the thing to go too high and to actually collapse. He just wanted to learn if he could control it for that six inches. So the thing went down the rail, and it lifted off, and it hit that top rail, and it broke the top rail because it, it had this great like up uh, burst of lift and it actually snapped the track and it fell over and it was destroyed. So he made it to it. So he made it, that's the thing. He made it horribly uncontrollably, <laughs> but he made it. This is what he says about the accident. Uh, I found myself floating in the air with the feeling of being in a boat. But unfortunately, a piece of the broken plank struck one of the screws, the propellers, and smashed it. I instantly shut off steam and the machine came to a state of rest on the earth, the wheels cutting deeply into the ground and leaving no track thus showing that they had settled down vertically and had not run along the ground before settling. This was the first time in the history of the world that a flying machine actually lifted itself and a man into the air, 1893. Now, he goes on to talk about uh, the machine was practically the same as the farming machine and so on. If I had a larger field, the, the quantity of water was too much, here are all the things I can fix. Shortly after this accident, I received notice from the landlord that the property had been sold to the London County Council for the purpose of erecting a very large imbecile asylum. It appears that I had prepared the ground, so all that was necessary was to erect the buildings. Uh, he never did build his flying machine. And uh, he, he turned his, his, his attention elsewhere, but he was so dedicated to bringing scientific rigor to this field that he, he contributed immeasurably to the field of uh, the science of aeronautics. And you notice how he disparaged ballooning. That's because there were a bunch of idiots out there in balloons at the time. <laughs> in his very excellent report recently made on the progress of aeronautics to the British Aeronautical Society, Mr. Francis W. Breary says, it is singular that no one has taken advantage of an ascertained fact to put the balloon to more pleasurable, <coughs> because more prolonged use, than has hitherto been attempted. After insisting how a boat may be caused to travel with the current of a stream, by simply using a pole to push it clear of the banks, he adds, there is every probability that, with a balloon so balanced, a push with a long pole would send it spinning for 50 feet or more, and one might traverse a few hundred yards before it neared the earth and required another push. So they're talking about taking a balloon, loading it so, uh, so much so that it's, it's balanced with the lift versus the weight, just hovering in the air. Then you can just be a gondola. Just pull yourself around. Why not, right? Logical. Shortly before undertaking the ascension in which he lost his life, <laughs> Mr. Donaldson, the well-known aeronaut, described to us his experience in just such balloon sailing. Now, who is Mr. Donaldson? Mr. Donaldson is Washington Harrison Donaldson, and this guy was amazing. This guy was the guy you think of when you think, crazy man <laughs> from the 1800s who goes around doing nonsense. He was a circus performer who decided that circuses were too sedate for him. <laughs> and so what he wanted to do was get into ballooning and do circus acts from the balloon. So what he would do is go up in the balloon, cut the basket free, and then be on a trapeze dangling from the balloon and then drift across farmlands 
doing trapeze acts, and people would look up and go, what the hell is that? <laughs> and then they would follow him, and when he came down, I guess they would give him money. I'm not sure what. <laughs> uh, P.T. Barnum did eventually, like, it, he got his money from people like Barnum and giant newspapers who were like, put our logo on your next balloon. And he's like, yes, okay, no problem. But he was a, he was a real pioneer in ballooning, and he had to figure out at every step when someone like Barnum came and said, I want to build a balloon twice as big as anything else, Donaldson said, no problem, I can fly it. And he had no idea how to fly it. <laughs> so he just had to invent it, but there were mishaps along the way. This was his first flight. Uh, he got the balance wrong, and he had to throw out his hat, coat, and boots to make the thing light enough to take off. This was a later flight. Uh, these were, uh, that's Donaldson on the bottom, and that's a man from the press, kind of in the middle. And up there is, a, I think he's a different reporter. And um, what happened was a, a storm kicked up, and Donaldson said, we got to bail out. Everyone get by the basket and hang on, and then we'll all jump at the same time. Well, the guy, uh, one of the guys didn't hear him properly. And so Donaldson and this other guy, uh, Ford, they are dangling, and they jump out, and the balloon shoots upward because now it's so much lighter. And this guy is stuck in the basket. He goes another two miles, eventually has to jump out into a tree. And this was par for the course. <laughs> so this is, from this perspective, like, like that's who this guy is when he says, Mr. Donaldson stated it as his belief that if ever the time came when people would step into balloons as readily as they now do into railroad cars, the airships would not sail above the clouds, but would skim close along the surface of the ground. He didn't want to get too high, because who knows what could happen, right? He doesn't have a great track record of this thing. He's like, you can totally fly a balloon, but just like, let's keep it low. <laughs> he gave many reasons for this view, notably increased safety and economy, since balloons could be made much smaller, as they would not require a large amount of gas to keep them afloat, and there would be little difficulty in stopping to replenish the supply when exhausted. He had found no trouble in balancing a balloon at four feet above the ground, and keeping it accurately at that height for hours. Four feet, he's sitting there for hours, four feet above the ground. He told us further that he frequently traveled along country roads in this way during calm weather, using a pole to push himself along when there was no wind, or to guide himself when being wafted by a breeze. This is when you start to realize, I don't know if you ever actually did this, but there's value in a, a newspaper thinking you did that, because it makes you awesome in their mind. They're like, Donaldson, he'll do anything. He's pulling a balloon around. <laughs> yeah, he didn't actually have to do it to get the article written about him. But maybe he did. As an instance of how exactly a balloon can be balanced, he stated that, while thus sailing over a road, he carelessly dropped overboard about a quarter of a loaf of bread, whereupon the airship sprang aloft a hundred feet or more. <laughs> we asked him how he avoided wagons and other similar obstacles in his path without discharging ballast and so losing equilibrium. Jump over them, was his answer. A good strong push downwards on my guiding pole has sent me flying over many a tree in which I thought I was sure to be entangled. This flea-like mode of progression was a favorite mode he had of astonishing rustics. That's another phrase I want to bring back. Astonishing rustics. So here's, let's go back to Maxim for just a second. Experiments of this character, meaning aeronautical uh, experiments in general, unless conducted with great care are exceedingly dangerous. No makeshift or imperfect apparatus should be employed, but the experimenter should have the advantage of the most perfect appliances and apparatus that modern civilization can afford. The necessary plant for conducting experiments in a proper and safe manner is unfortunately much more expensive than the machine itself. If I find that my experiments require more money than I have at my disposal, I feel sure that some future experimenter more fortunate than myself will commence where I leave off, and so on. This, one, this guy was a consummate scientist to be looked up to by, by everyone in the sciences. Meanwhile, Donaldson. <laughs> the 48th ascension, and he made 130-something before he did not come back from one, was made on May 15, 1874. The villagers gathered around him like the natives did around Columbus and watched every movement he made. After taking a sufficient number of stores, he took his departure amid the cheers and hurrahs of the crowd. During this trip, he engaged in that delightful sport of trailing the drag rope. This is the rope that hangs from the balloon so people can grab it and pull it back down to earth. Bushes would be bent over and rail fences jerked open with a degree of speed not common for the farmers. So this balloon is being pushed by the wind, and there's an anchor on this thing that's just tearing through everything in the path. <laughs> Chickens scampered for their lives, and sheep would run in every direction. As he was passing along, he chanced to go over a yard where a man and a woman were engaged in making apple butter. 
Donaldson has an eye for business and concluded he would thicken the apple butter for them. And at the proper time, he poured a lot of sand out of a bag that went direct in the kettle of apple butter. The woman looked up and saw. Just then, Donaldson gave a few terrible blasts on his bugle and made some remarks about Gabriel and the judgment. This was the other thing he liked to do, was he carried a bugle along. There's another, uh, another uh, flight on which he was flying at night. He started blowing on the trumpet and saying, Gabriel is here, and all the lights go off in all the houses beneath as people start to pray. The woman took a tantrum, fell down, and rolled over two or three times, and started, started for the house on all fours after the broom and butcher knife. The man, after getting the sand out of his face and mouth sufficiently to see the cause of all the trouble, drew back the ladle, and with a clenched fist, he threatened to demolish the man in the balloon. Donaldson was wafted out of, night, out of sight to the tune of that man's chin music at the rate of about 2.40 on the pike. The trailing and sailing were continued for some time, and by means of variable currents, he traveled over a good portion of southern and central New York. After a three hours ride, he landed at halfway station between Auburn and Syracuse, at least 100 miles from point of starting direct line. The gas was let out, and the balloon shipped to Ithaca by way of Geneva. The balloon had to remain at the depot in Geneva all night. But as that building was consumed by fire on the same night, the balloon was burned up. This just happened all the time. So you could never tell what was going to happen. Even if you had a delightful day ruining apple butter, your balloon could be consumed by fire the same night. Such was the life of an adventurer in the 1800s. Nothing was taken for granted. But everyone was consumed with the spirit of adventure. And here is a, a sort of humorous column from Scientific American and that some of you may relate to how the inventor plagues his poor wife. A facetious chap connected with one of our daily newspapers gives the following amusing burlesque on the trials of an inventor's wife. It is all very well to talk about working for the heathens, said one, as ladies put up their sewing. But I'd like to have someone tell me, what am I to do with my husband? What is the matter with him? asked a sympathetic old lady. William is a good man, continued the first, waving her glasses in an argumentative way. But William will invent. He goes inventing round from morning till night, and I have no peace or comfort. I didn't object when he invented a fire escape, but I did remonstrate when he wanted me to crawl out the window one night last winter to see how it worked. Then he originated a lock through the door that wouldn't open from midnight till morning to keep burglars out. First time he's tr the first time he tried it, he caught his coat tail in it, and I had to walk around him with a pan of hot coals all night to keep him from freezing. Well, why didn't he take his coat off? Well, I wanted him to, but he stood around until the thing opened himself, opened itself, trying to invent some way of unfastening it. That's William's trouble. He will invent. A little while ago, he got up a cabinet bedstead that would shut and open without handling. It went by clockwork. William got into it, and up it went. Bless your heart, he stayed in there from Saturday afternoon till Sunday night, when it flew open and disclosed William with the plans and specifications of a patent washbowl that would tip over just when it got so full. The result was I lost all my rings and the breast pin down the wastepipe. <laughs> then he got up a crutch for a man that could also be used as an opera glass. Whenever the man leaned on it, up it went, and when he put it to his eye to find William, it flew out into a crutch and almost broke the top of his head off. Once he invented a rope ladder to be worn as a guard chain and lengthened out with a spring. He put it around his neck, but the spring got loose and turned it into a ladder and almost choked him to death. <laughs> then he invented a patent boot heel to crack nuts with, but he mashed his thumb with it and gave it up. Why, he has a washed up full of inventions. One of them is a prayer book that always opens at the right place. We tried it one morning at church, but the wheels and the springs made such a noise that the sexton took William by the collar and told him to leave his fire engines at home when he came to worship. The other day I saw him going up the street with a model of a grain elevator sticking out of his hip pocket, and he is fixing up an improved shot tower in our bedroom. When I read this, it made me think, there's something about human nature that doesn't change over time. <laughs> and here's another wonderful example of that. This is nature. This is the evidence that not everybody is as excited about progress. If you've ever heard, I'm sure you have, the idea that uh, the kids today, the technological the advances we have are, 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 we're losing something important about our humanity. My thesis is that we always felt that way, always, even back when, you know, 100 years ago, when we, we feel like things may have been simpler. <clears throat> now, New penalties and distresses persistently and inexorably follow each new invention. And that which man believes for, to be for his amelioration inevitably bears a satellite of evil in its train. Fresh calamities and new diseases not only come to view, but they are discovered to be actually produced by the novel appliances which have been regarded as benefits and wonderful improvements. Household conveniences beget unexpected annoyances. Rapid locomotion involves fatalities. 
and mechanical contrivances to reduce labor impoverish multitudes while they benefit the few. Indeed, it may be stated as a postulate on general principles that the ratio of evil is 100 to 1 of good accomplished by man's inventions. But man's progressive works are not only destroying himself, but they are hastening the destruction of the earth, in whose ultimate fate mankind is commonly involved. It may well be questioned whether, in view of the startling and unforeseen consequences of scientific success, which have changed the aspect and economy of the entire globe within the last 50 years, we have not overstepped the mortal bounds of science, the moral bounds of science, by perverting the knowledge which man came into possession of surreptitiously when he ate of the forbidden fruit. When Benjamin Frank Franklin first called down the lightning from the sky, he was accursed by the superstitious or reverential with tempting the Almighty. Now we handle the subtile element, electricity, as if it were inert matter. We, imp we impress it into our nurseries as a toy for the children. We tap the bowels of the earth and subject to our, dom our domestic use the vapors. We experiment with the volcano and the geyser, the mysterious medicine spring and the poison valley. We toy with the weirdest phenomena of nature as if they were familiar spirits. We have built a tower of Babel at Paris. We have, pho we have phonographed the breadth of life so that the dead may speak years after they have departed from the earth. It's not like the glossograph. <laughs> For years we have been attempting to make water burn. No idea what he means there. Perverting the divine economy to the economy of man and reversing the purposes of the creator. And as soon as ever the effort is crowned with success, the destruction of the world is no longer a question of centuries, but of years. At present, our most dangerous pet is electricity. In the telegraph, the street lamp, and the telephone, we have introduced electric power into our simplest domestic industries. And we have woven this most subtitle of agents, once active only in the sublimest manifestations of omnipotence, like a web about our dwellings and filled our atmosphere with the filaments of death. <laughs> it is urged that electric lighting is not essential to the public comfort. It is not a necessity, but a luxury. By abolishing it, we reduce our danger appreciably. The telegraph is essential to rapid inter intercommunication in this age and will be retained. But its operation must be subjected to proper safeguards. The telephone is the most dangerous of all because it enters into every dwelling. Its interminable network of wires is a perpetual menace to life and property, and its best performance is only a convenience. It was never a necessity. In a multitude of cities, its service is unsatisfactory and is being dispensed with. Some things that do not change. Already the conservative public has taken the alarm, and it has become our urgent duty in the interest of personal safety, think of the children, to clip the pinions of the winged messenger and draw its claws. Measures are in order to undo the mischief as rapidly as possible and to get back to as safe a condition as we were before. So, there's always two sides to everything. And I also found people who objected to the in invention of the printing press and the notion of writing itself. So, uh, I think what we do as humans is fear change, not the technology in particular but simply things that are different. This is a comic from Punchinello Magazine, which is the New York version of uh, the, the great London satirical Punch. And uh, we've got a lecturer there giving a talk, maybe the talk we just heard. The lady there with the ear trumpet, fellow there in the back kind of snoozing, and here's a guy trying to take notes up in the front. The lecturer says, there is a cumulative approximativeness, so to speak, a period when the recalcitrant corpuscles begins to the stenographer is thinking, confound the fellow. I knew he'd break my pencil with his infernal jaw smashers. Jaw smashers I would like to bring back. <laughs> you guys are taking notes. Um, and the humor of, these, uh, of, of, of this age is, is really, really interesting to me as well. Because it speaks to uh, so much of the national character, but also a, a sensibility of how to tell stories that has really changed over time. Uh, for example, here's a little joke that was published in Harper's. I was perambulating the piazza of the blank hotel in company with the daughter of the landlord. She had been recounting to me all her father's little successes and reverses in life ever since he had adopted the profession of a Boniface. And among the latter, that is the reverses, the rather prominent and discouraging one of having his hostelry burned down without the mitigating circumstances of any insurance upon it. I profess a proper amount of sympathy for, for so great a calamity and ventured to inquire whether accident or the torch of the incendiary had wrought such ruin. How? inquired Rustica. Was it the work of an incendiary? I repeated. She looked at me with a puzzled air for a moment and then, 
No, said she, slowly shaking her head. No, someone set fire to it. <laughs> I held in by a strong effort, but feeling that an explosion was imminent, I rushed madly away. <laughs> That's my favorite part, where they overshoot the punchline by about a sentence and a half. <laughs> and this is another one. This is from a little bit later. A criticism of the theatrical criticism in this morning's paper. <laughs> by Sharply Harpoon in this morning star of last night's performance of Sheets and Pillowcases started off promisingly. For two paragraphs, it seemed that originality had at last come into its own in dramatic criticism. Here, finally, you felt, was a dramatic critic whose one idea had not been to get to bed. Rare knowledge of the theater was shown in every one of the first two paragraphs. The critic had actually seen the show. The remaining 26 paragraphs were something else again. While there was still, in fact, stronger evidence that the critic had seen the show he was criticizing, there began to appear in the third paragraph an unmistakable sleepiness. The suggestion of sheets and pillowcases was too much for Mr. Harpoon. The third paragraph was a stifled hum hum hum. His fourth paragraph was Frankie yawn. And at the start of the fifth paragraph, it was perfectly obvious that he had used scissors and paste. For the next 16 paragraphs were given up entirely to a revelation of the plot. Nobody who read those 16 paragraphs will care to see the show. They robbed the story of any interest it might possibly have, but it is safe to say nobody read them. So the sum total of nightly attendances of sheets of pillowcases will be in no way affected by Mr. Harpoon's criticism. On the whole, the criticism was much too appreciative, as are all criticisms today. When shall we have dramatic critics who will condemn 95 plays out of 100? Makes little difference which 95, they all need it. <laughs> Critics will just do that for a while until the public again has some confidence in their discretion. They may then increase the number gradually. But even the gladdest of critics should not be permitted to appreciate more than 15 plays out of 100. We should have a criticism censorship to see to that. As for the last eight paragraphs of Mr. Harpoon's comments, it was clear that he wrote them standing up, putting on his hat and coat all the while. He must have been halfway up the office before the last paragraph was complete. When, oh when, will our dramatic critics quit going home before they write their criticisms? It almost makes us drowsy to write about Mr. Harpoon's criticism of sheets and pillowcases. Even we critics of critics must watch ourselves, or we shall give occasion for the creation of a new professional group. Critics of critics of critics. <laughs> it is possible that a person may become too smart to criticize anything except criticism or criticism of criticism. Perhaps that is why we have so few first-rate, first-hand critics today. <laughs> And then, like I said, all kinds of great information for you. Here's the Philadelphia Record Almanac with food and drinks for sick people. How about some beef tea for the sick? <laughs> you guys will love this recipe. Take careful notes. One pound of lean beef, cut into small pieces. No problem, got it. Put into jar without a drop of water. Okay, we can do that. Cover tightly, easy. Set in a pot of cold water. We got all that stuff here. Heat gradually to a boil, fine, and continue this steadily for three or four hours until the meat is like white rags. It's kind of gross. And the juice is all drawn out. Season with salt to taste and when cold, skim. The patient will often prefer this ice cold to hot. Sounds disgusting. Sounds like really disgusting. But beef tea is one of those nutritive drinks that you see all the time in the Victorian era. This has got so much nutrients on them, nutrients in them. Just like toast water. <laughs> you like some toast water? Here's how you make it. You can do this at home. Carefully remove the crust from a slice of stale bread. Toast the slice through on both sides, but do not burn it. Break the slice into three or four pieces and put them in a pitcher with a small piece of orange or lemon peel. Pour on a pint of boiling water, cover up with a napkin, and when cold, strain off the water for use. It should be freshly made, especially warm weather. So it's not toast, it's just water that toast has been in. <laughs> but if that's not hard enough for you, how about some toast soup? Take a thin slice of stale wheat bread and toast it until it's brown through and through. Be careful you do not burn it. If you burn it, it ruins the toast. <laughs> While it is still hot, spread some butter over it, but not, no more than will strike into the bread without leaving any on the surface. Now break it into fragments, put the pieces into a pitcher, and pour on rather more than half a pint of boiling water. A little pepper and salt improves the taste, so they may be added. This drink is usually found very acceptable to sick or delicate persons, and at the same time is quite nutritious. So, bachelors. <laughs> what else we got? We got uh, some brandy. <laughs> Nothing else, just brandy. <laughs> when brandy is ordered for a sick child, it is meant that a few drops, according to the age, should be given in water or some sweet milk, as, as often as the condition of the patient requires it. Unless told to do otherwise, keep it in reserve for the time of the day when the sufferer appears to exhibit signs of being weaker than usual. 
and then give enough to restore it to its average condition in health. Try not to get above that. <laughs> Usually it is more frequently needed in the latter part of the day, or quite early in the morning than other times. So basically any time. <laughs> milk punch. Milk punch and beef tea were like, like, like the, the, the Adam and Eve of uh, uh, Victorian medicinal concoctions. Pour two tablespoonfuls of good brandy into six tablespoonfuls of sweet milk. Add two te teaspoons full of ground loaf sugar. Grate some nutmeg into it, and the punch is ready for use. Sounds simple, right? An adult person can take a tablespoonful of this every two or three hours. But for infants or children, you must remember that one-fourth of it is brandy. <laughs> <laughs> milk punch is much ordered by physicians for people who have low fevers and for those who are debilitated. Milk punch was so popular back in the Victorian era, I found as many different recipes for milk punch as I found citations for it. Uh, this one has uh, the rind of Seville oranges and lemons. Uh, it uses rum. Typically, it's some sort of zest, citrus zest with, with, uh, with rum or brandy uh, in with some sweet milk or cream. It's really good, right? Mr. Country House takes a milk punch. <laughs> <laughs> I told you how they love puns, right? So essentially, any term that exists in the culture is liable for a treatment like this. This is my, probably my favorite image. Maybe in the world. <laughs> because when I first found it, I had no idea what milk punch was. And I thought, all right, <laughs> it's a milk punch. Boy, look at that guy. <laughs> so I thought, man, I guess that's what it's called. When the cow kicks you in the, in the gut, that's a milk punch. All right. I love this so much, I had to go learn about milk punch. Now it's a little bit less special for me. But it still holds a special place in my heart. And uh, here's, a, here's an ad for Chesterfield Cigarettes. How I Saved a Policeman's Life. And it's a little poem. <laughs> if I can read it. <clears throat> Even the eggs were tired that morning, and the coffee didn't fool me one bit. But when after breakfast, my cigarette tasted awful. It was too much. And a grouch started. Walking to work, I swore off smoking. Decided to fire my office boy. But just before I decided to kill a policeman, a man passed me, smoking a cigarette. I'd say that the smoke that drifted back did smell good. I followed him into a store. He threw down two dimes and said the same, so did I. So I'm still smoking. I still keep that office boy, and I let that handsome policeman live. And I'm going... <clears throat> yeah. I'm, uh, it's really very small. Most, I think. Yeah. That man I followed, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to essentially nominate him. That man I followed for president or something. But really, those cigarettes do satisfy. I like that he was about to kill a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how you sell cigarettes. <laughs> I kind of did that in like an Obama voice, because I could figure him like, it's got his cadence to it. It was too much. I swore off smoking, decided to fire my office boy. But I'd not kill a policeman. <laughs> I could probably not run this ad today. <laughs> <laughs> so, Milk Punch, my favorite image. Bad Boys, first read of my favorite book ever. Uh, Frank Bellew, uh, uh, caricature cartoonist. This is a book for children. So, Victorian children's literature had one thing in common it tells children to sit down and shut up and not do anything of interest at all and stay out of their parents' way. That's the unifying like, field theory of Victorian children's literature. <laughs> Uh, so here is a book for, uh, for children, ostensibly. Uh, a little sort of an alphabet book. A, A lad. <laughs> all right, it doesn't really start with A, but that's all right. <laughs> a lad with a gun. Can the lad shoot the gun? No, but the gun can shoot the lad. He is not careful. <laughs> all right, good lesson for kids. B, boy. Has this boy a new toy hoe? Yes, this boy has a new toy hoe. Can the boy use his new toy hoe? Oh, yes, the boy can use his new toy hoe. He's kind of smashing things around there. <laughs> Z, cove. Here is a nice cove. Is there a boat in the cove? Oh yes, there's a boat in the cove, and there is a cove in the boat. All right, I'll help you out here. Cove, old flesh, and slang for a guy. So this is a pun. This is a pun. It took me a while to get it, but it's a pun. D, dog. A tree and a man and a dog. The tree gives umbrageous protection to the man. The man owns the dog, and the dog guards the man. The dog is a noble animal. Look at that dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a noble animal. In fact, there is nothing noble about the tree, the man, or the dog. <laughs> e, egg. See, this boy has an egg. Can the boy suck the egg? Oh no, the boy cannot suck the egg. It is a bad egg. Look at that bad egg. He does not like that egg. So don't do that, kid. You, you, we're going to skip forward a little bit. <laughs> Maybe not the 
the right message to send. <laughs> Here are some new lambs. Do you lambs play cards? Oh no, they do not play cards, but they gamble on the green. All right, see? Very clever. Oh. Yeah. So this is where the book starts to take a weird turn. <laughs> v, verily. All right, not the best word maybe for V, but kind of a weird word. Verily, my son, here is a fine large fish. Do you think he is a trout? No, I think he must be a smelt, for I smelt him. All right, good job, guys. <laughs> w, where? Where are the figs and the nuts and the plums and the cakes? Did this boy eat the figs and the nuts and the plums and the cakes? Oh, yes. The boy did eat the figs and the nuts and the plums and the cakes. Now, he regrets eating those figs and nuts and plums and cakes. Don't do this, kids. You'll feel horrible. X, XL. <laughs> Here is a fine boy who wants to excel in his class. See, they do know how to spell it. <laughs> does he know his lessons? No, he does not. But he is going over them. <laughs> this is it's starting to be a stretch. It's a stretch. Why? Year. See the pig and the dog. The pig cries, weak, weak, weak. Should the pig cry, weak, weak? Oh no, he should not cry, weak, weak. For he is taken by the ear. Ear. That's a real stretch. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's get to Z. Zebra. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Ornithorhynchus paradoxus a species of duck-billed platypus? Oh yes! <laughs> the Ornithorhynchus paradoxus is a species of duck-billed platypus. I suspect the book is sending the wrong message. <laughs> it goes on, there's a little more sort of uh, ancillary uh, material. That is right, kick the pig out of it! The pig should be in the sty or in the mud. He must not live in the house. This is where you get a window into the society of the time. How often is this a, a concern? Uh, <laughs> pig. pig is not enjoying this, this process at all. Here's an ass. Can an ass fly? Oh no, an ass cannot fly. With a good meaning of trying the moon. <laughs> this bad man has been partaking of that torturous stimulant known as crooked whiskey. Is it not reprehensible to partake of such potent alcoholic beverages? I think this is a book for children. <laughs> but I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> Behold the wise statesman. He rejoiceth that he stole the public funds, for he hath ease and oriental luxury. Would you remain in squalid honesty when by stealing you may become rich and joyful? <laughs> Some bitterness creeping through. <laughs> And finally this, here is Isabella perusing a volume. She loves to peruse while her imbecile companions waste their time in boisterous amusements. She will grow up to be a wise woman if she does not die. <laughs> 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 so Frank Bella, the author of this book, is a humorist, and so it, uh, the, 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 uh, the possibility exists that he wrote this book for a satirical purpose. I tend to think that it was sort of a practical joke on us. <laughs> but back to Washington Dunn. The ass in the balloon. Uh, this is his final ascension, 139th ascension. 1875. This was an attempt to cross the Atlantic. He had with him two men, uh, reporters both, and they, uh, there was to be a third, but there was not, in the, they had to take too many provisions and there wasn't the, the, the ability to carry the, the third man, in, or the fourth man total in the balloon. So they had to flip a coin. One man got to go and the other man had to stay behind. 1875. Near 5 p.m., the, the P.T. Barnum, which was the name of the balloon that Barnum had paid for, left the Hippodrome carrying Washington, Harrison, Donaldson, one of the world's greatest and best aeronauts, and Newton S. Grimwood, reporter for the Chicago Evening Journal. The balloon, with its 83,000 cubic feet of gas and 800 pounds of sand and two passengers, um, so I guess it was just Washington and Grimwood, so there was a third man who had to stay behind, rose gracefully to an altitude of about 5,000 feet and floated steadily to the northeast. 
out over Lake Michigan in a direction that would, if followed, take them near Grand Haven, Michigan, 120 miles distant. Thousands of upturned eyes watch the graceful balloon as it moves steadily before the breeze at a rate of about 15 miles an hour. At 6.30, one hour and a half from the time of starting, many eyes were yet fastened upon the balloon, anxious perhaps about the descent, or wishing that a counter current would send them back. Loved ones looked with eager eyes until tears blurred the balloon from their sight, and as the balloon faded from view, darkness enveloped the city. The speculation was already rife, and anxiety manifested itself in many minds. At 7 p.m., the little guy, standing out some 30 miles from the Illinois shore off Gross Point, and about 12 miles north of Chicago, this is a boat, sighted the balloon, and observing it, occasionally dipping the basket in the lake, only a mile and a half distant, trying not pull anything, probably. <laughs> The little guide headed for the balloon, but before it could overtake the balloon, there seemed to be a sudden lightening of the car. And the airship shot upward to a great height and soon disappeared from the view of the crew of the schooner. So we know why there is occasionally a sudden lightening of the balloon. And uh, his body was found about a month later, Grimwood the passenger. This was the last that was ever seen of the balloon. That night, a terrific storm swept down upon the lake. A hurricane <coughs> whose volume and fury none can know added terror to the Sumerian darkness. Powerful indeed must be the pen that could describe a midnight hurricane from their standpoint, the intensity of night made brilliant by the flashes of lightning, the quietude disturbed by the pealing thunder that would seem to shake the world asunder. The awful position that they could scarcely realize, no doubt, palsied them with fear. Yea, though, though they were brave, yet when death comes so plain, what heart would not tremble? their suffering, their agony, their terror, their heart-rending cries, and their thoughts of friends and home, none can know. Donaldson, brave, heroic, and skilled, no doubt strained every nerve to protect his passenger, and like the bold, noble, and true captain, sank with Grimwood to a watery grave. Donaldson's body was never found. Uh, the New York Times report, he was found in a barn uh, like a month later, but that's sort of like the Elvis sighting kind of deal, and uh, that, was never, that was never verified. But this is what Donaldson said on an earlier occasion. This is a guy, remember, who made a point. He invented the art of trapeze ballooning. I have noted on different occasions a class of people who were only half alive and who find fault with my exercise, which to them looks frightful. Their nervous system is not properly balanced. They have too much nerves for their system, which is caused by a want of a little moderate exercise up there where the air is pure, instead of which they spend hours in a place where they call their office. They sit themselves in a dark corner, hidden from the sun's rays, in one position to remain for hours, inhaling the poisonous air with the room full of carbonic acid gas, carbon dioxide, which is as poisonous to man as arsenic is to rats. And in addition to this, we'll fill their lungs with tobacco smoke, and to steady their nerves require a stimulation of perhaps eight or ten brandies a day. Well, maybe they just weren't feeling well. If I were as helpless as this class of people, then my life would be swinging by a thread, and I would wind up with a broken neck. Preferred the life in the balloon, to any safe life on the ground. 1879, Frank Leslie's Popular Monthly. Modern civilization may well be described by the words so generally applied to fire. A good servant, but a bad master. At no previous period have the appliances for easy and comfortable living been so numerous or so generally distributed among all classes. And the men of today have much cause for congratulation compared with even with those of a generation since. Whether for purposes of business or pleasure, the number of man's servants has of late greatly increased. The telegraph, the telephone, the locomotive, and the steamship, the modern printing press, and thousands of minor devices, which add immensely to the sum total of his pleasures, are all willing servants if properly used. But once in control, they become the hardest taskmasters. The telegraph and telephone offer a ready and useful service at all times, but again, they often become the most rigid feathers, binding a man's whole life to the office and exchange, Steam has increased to an enormous extent the ease and pleasure of traveling, but it is now too often used as a means for a rapid rush from place to place, with none of the pleasures which accompany more deliberate travel. And the many other adjuncts are too generally misapplied as a means for accumulating a little more money, building up a short-lived fame at the expense of health and true enjoyment. Men have come to live fast, rather, to live rather than well. 1879, sentiment that is fairly common today, I think, too. Typical issue of Scientific American looks sort of like this. You have all sorts of things. There's the official list of patents, everything that was issued in that week. Uh, 
a little blurb about American inventions in Europe, give you a little cosmopolitan sense of what's going on elsewhere in the world. Here's an article about steam boiler incrustations, a very practical article, so you can make sure your boiler is functioning at top, top performance. Uh, here's an article about spontaneous combustion of the human body, <laughs> um, but to its credit, uh, is debunking the, uh, the notion. And right in the middle is this, the maddening mechanism of thought, in between the steam boiler incrustations and the list of patents, this essay by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Our brains are 70 year clocks. The angel of life winds them up once for all and then closes the case and gives the key into the hand of the angel of the resurrection. Tick tack, tick tack go the wheels of thought. Our will cannot stop them. They cannot stop themselves. Sleep cannot still them. Madness only makes them go faster. Death alone can break into the case. And seizing the ever swinging pendulum which we call the heart, silence at last, the clicking of the terrible escapement you've carried so long beneath our wrinkled foreheads. If we could only get at them as we lie on our pillows and count the dead beats of thought after thought and image after image jarring through the overtired organ, will nobody block these wheels, uncouple that pinion, cut the string that holds these weights, blow up the infernal machine with gunpowder? What a passion comes over us sometimes for silence and rest that this dreadful mechanism, unwinding the endless tapestry of time, embroidered with spectral figures of life and death, could have but one brief holiday. Who could wonder that men swing themselves off from beams and hempen lassos? They jump off from parapets into the swift and gurgling waters beneath. That they take counsel of the grim fiend, who has but to utter his one peremptory monosyllable, and the restless machine is shivered as a case that is dashed upon a marble floor. Under that building which we pass every day, there are strong dungeons where neither hook, nor bar, nor bed cord, nor drinking vessel from which any sharp fragment may be shattered shall by any chance be seen. There is nothing for it. And your brain is on fire with the whirling of its wheels, but to spring against the stone wall and silence them with one crash. Ah, they remembered that, the kind city fathers, and the walls are nicely padded, so that one can take such exercise as he likes without damaging himself. If anybody would really contrive some kind of a lever that one could thrust in among the works of this horrid automaton and check them or alter their rate of going, what would the world give for the discovery? Men are very apt to try and get at the machine by some indirect means or, or other. They clap on the brakes by means of opium, or they change the maddening monotony of the rhythm by means of fermented liquors. It is because the brain is locked up. We cannot touch its movements directly, that we thrust these coarse tools in through any crevice by which they may reach the interior. Also, our trade is going for a while, and at last, spoil the machine. When I uh, talk to people who are interested in sort of the Victorian era and, and the, the aesthetic of it, or their steampunks, or you know, whatever it is, there's a sense of like, on oh, the good old days when things were awesome. And I think the much scarier notion is the fact that we have not changed. And the reason that's scary is because it implies that the things that we suffer from now are constant, they're part of human nature, and that we will always suffer from them. And it's very difficult to learn how to deal with that because we think, oh, if only there will, is this new technological advancement, this awesome app is gonna get me organized, or this new system, or this book I'm gonna read, or whatever it is. But they felt the same way 100 years ago as we feel today, and so the implication is that we're gonna feel the same way 100 years from now, right? That there's no way to fix it, there's no way to make it better. That's a tremendously distressing thought. So I was thinking about this, and I'm thinking, if this is true, what do we do? What do we do? And the best solution I can think of, I'm happy to share it with you here. Just laugh about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, do we have, is the room free? Um, what day is it? It's Monday? It if no Monday. one's here already, then we'll probably have it for a while. Okay, so, um, can you hang out for a few yeah, minutes for to. questions? Yeah, if anyone and, has any questions. And, uh, but it is 12 o'clock if anyone needs to uh, get going on to the next place. So we'll do maybe five or ten minutes for questions. Sure, and then yeah. Anyone else who wants to come up afterwards? Cool. All right. That's good. Do we have anything to say? And if not, it's okay. Like, don't feel obligated. <laughs> and if nothing else, I'm happy to sign your books, too. That you all come hang out to. Yes. Yeah, so how do you find all of these cool things? I mean, clearly you said some people like just send you random books. Yeah, um, well, 
with the way it started was I um, uh, I think I had one book of clip art that was a commercially published book of clip art, and then I realized because I was making comics using these little engravings, and I'm like, well. Uh, I could use this clip art, but everyone else has the access to the same clip art, and so you kind of see the same images cropping up a lot. So I thought, where did the clip art come from? And so luckily the books have introductions, and they say this is from such and such magazine. So I went to the library in LA, and they have a bunch of uh, archives on microfilm. And I was able to look up those particular magazines and newspapers that they had cited, and I thought, uh, a priest and I had a list of really cool like like uh, images on this you know <coughs> microphone. I'd write down like such and such year, such and such title, and then I started looking for those exact books on eBay, and I'd get ones that were damaged and didn't have any collector's value because like the cover was missing or it was it got stained or something or a kid had drawn over half of it. You know, so get a sense of the the era and sort of the the types of titles that might have things that, that I'd like, and the collection kind of grew over time. And then it got to the point where, again, people would start sending me the things after I've been doing it for a while. And uh, I would look online for, oh, here's you know Harper's 1879. But this article is a two-parter. So what about Harper's 1880? Well, what about that one? So that's where Google Books is actually super helpful. And a lot of these articles that, I mean, you saw some of them were scans from physical paper, but a lot of them were from Google Books as well. Because I can do research where I can type in uh, a certain author I'm looking up like Hiram Maxim, I can see different articles published about him. And so that's where, at this point, Google Books has been like my, my whole second library that I, I use for for compiling sets of information like this. Although I can't use it to make the comics because it's all low res, so I'll be on that too. <laughs> How much time do you spend just paging through actual old books um, or magazines? A lot. Uh, it's tough because I get really captivated by it. Like when you start, it's hard. It's hard. You get just like in, into the reading, and it's hard to stop. And uh, in fact, some of the books I got have uh, more recently have been in other languages, which makes it way easier because I don't get sucked into it. <laughs> um, but um, when I'm making the comics, occasionally I will have an idea for a certain uh, figure or character or pose, and then I have to find something that matches that. And so then it's a matter of like looking through everything with an eye for, I, mean, I, I need a doctor, I need something that looks reasonably like a doctor. Nope, not here. All right, and if I was just drawing the thing, I could just draw it. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, yeah, so sometimes it's, there's a lot of time spent with that, and other times it's, uh, uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to get sucked into it. Yeah. The, uh, the book, what was it, the book for bad boys? Uh, yeah. Do you, do you have an impression how that was received at the time? Have you seen reviews of it or, or anything? Is that is that is I, that like this? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I wish I knew more about it. I've seen other people and sort of cited nowadays because they've sort of discovered it. Um, but uh, I don't think it was tremendously widely published. Like there are very few copies of it in print still. Like like left in libraries, I've discovered. Although what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to be in D.C. in a couple months. I'm going to go to the Library of Congress, and they have one, and I'm going to scan it, and I'm going to reprint it, because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but I, I mean, Frank Bellew, again, he was a humorist, he was a caricaturist, he was an editorial cartoonist, and so I get the sense that it was written sort of satirically. But there are other pages, like I skipped over a bunch of them, but there are others that are written much more straight, like, like, like a children's book. And so either the his humor was not that good, and it was not that clever, and so it seems like, you know, you, you, I don't get the joke, or, you know, he was kind of towing that line between, yeah, this is plausibly a children's book, but I'm going to slip into super weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. You said there are historical objections to the writing? It's yeah, like well, um, Socrates, whom we only know uh, because Plato wrote down his argument. Uh, objected to writing uh, as a as a discipline. He he thought that when you wrote something down, you weakened your mind because the only way you can have a legitimate thought is by is by arguing it out with somebody. And when you have uh, something written down, it's only a one-sided argument. So if you read something, you're not being taught it; you're simply being told it. You don't have to puzzle it out with a, a conversation like the Socrates himself. Um, and when you write something you are necessarily presenting something in a lesser form than you might be able to do by 
explaining it to somebody and getting their feedback and tailoring what you can teach them in a very particular way. And um, I don't know that he ever quite sees the, like the import that like there is nothing that persists from generation to generation unless you write something down. And that's where the irony comes in, is we wouldn't even know he objected to writing if Plato hadn't written it down. <laughs> and in the same way, there was a monk who wrote a screed called uh, In Defense of Scribes about how the printing press was going to degrade people's understanding of scripture. Because in order to really understand scripture, you have to spend hours transcribing it. And you really get into it. And if you just are reading a printed version of it, it just glosses past you. And of course, nobody would have known of his argument if it hadn't been printed and certainly if it hadn't. <laughs> yeah? Do you run into lots of interesting people when you're paging through 1800s magazines in microfilm? Uh, well, oh, you mean like, like physical people in the library? Yeah. Or, um, the people that are most often in the basement of the library are homeless people. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I overhear interesting conversations where people say, you can't sleep in here, get out. Um, and unfortunately there's not like this secret society, at least that I've experienced, of like researchers who are like conducting interesting like experiments in, 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 the, in the archives. I kind of wish like, yeah, that would be a great like young adult novel, is like the kids who are trying to solve the mystery of like the old clock by like looking at the newspaper and stuff, but I have not found those kids yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Awesome. Great guys, thanks for, thanks for laughing already. Thank